in this session of buddhism we are going to discuss more details about buddhism the philosophy the principles what is the ashtanga marga as described by siddhartha and buddha what are the different sects different groups of buddhism what made buddhism become the largest religion and also the reasons for the decline of buddhism in this country buddhism siddhartha if you remember at the age of 29 when he left the household for 6 years he was actually traveling as a wandering monk during that period allara kalama and uddaka ramputta were actually the gurus of siddhartha for 45 years he was roaming as a wandering monk and wandering teacher after his salvation after his enlightenment Buddha was also the first and Buddha himself created the first sangha that is why the sequence is Buddha sangha dharma Siddhartha became Buddha in uh, Bodh Gaya then he formed sangha which eventually went to UP Sarnath and from there he gave the first sermon which is the dhamma so Buddha sangha dhamma and buddha died at the age of 80 483 bc in kusinagara kasia district of deoria in eastern up present day eastern up and siddhartha's death event is generally referred to as mahapari nirvana nirvana is enlightenment mahapari nirvana is death so the symbols of buddha's life his birth symbolized this lotus or bull his great departure galloping horse enlightenment nirvana as bodhi tree people tree in bodh gaya first charman dharma chakra parivartana churning of the wheel of law eight spoked wheels these are basically eight principles which buddha gave and buddha's death pari nirvana or stupa what are the important doctrines of buddhism or what buddha said see buddha as i have already told multiple times he was actually a practical reformer buddha tried to solve the problems of the day rather than talking about metaphysics and universe and purpose of life and world and earth and astronomy none of this buddha was a practical reformer he never got involved into the fruitless controversies about atma paramatma brahma the buddha's logic was you want salvation you want nirvana you have to do it yourself you may believe in atma you may not believe in atma it doesn't matter buddha tried to solve the worldly problems for him karma was the main force that drives samsara and samsara according to buddha is the continuous cycle of birth and death and birth and death so buddha believed in karma good karma good results single point in buddha's life and buddha never talked about things regard on which he himself did not have control like god and all those things so the four noble truth which i said buddha said was sorrow dukha dukha samudaya the cause of sorrow dukha nirodha one can always prevent to sorrow dukha nirodhagami pratipada marga that is the eight fold path he suggested people to follow the eight fold path which was essential for one to end their sorrows the four noble truth this four noble truth are sometimes also referred to as arya satya or buddha satya it is also called buddha satya or buddha dhamma or arya satya the four noble truth what was the eight fold path he gave simple eight rules right livelihood right attitude or right effort right mindfulness right concentration right understanding right thoughts 
right speech and right conduct. So, thought, conduct, speech, understanding, concentration. Thought, conduct, speech, understanding, concentration, focus, effort, living. This was basically Buddha's eight principles. Living, effort, focus, concentration. Living, effort, focus, concentration. Understanding, thought, speech, conduct. Strictly. Eightfold path. And Buddha said, follow this eightfold path and you will get salvation. At the same time, the central core theory of Buddha's philosophy is Madhyama Marga. Buddhism avoids extremities of anything. No extreme self-indulgence, no extreme self-mortification. Basically, self-mortification means completely giving up everything, tyaga everything, not to get involved into anything. Neither this nor becoming too intelligent or too indulgent into material things of life. The striving for salvation according to Buddha requires the performance of silas or moralities. The next requisite is samadhi, third is prajna. One, first people should have moralities, then they need to have concentration and focus and then they can do insight. Once they keep doing this, moralities, concentration, insight. It is a continuous repetitive cycle. Morality, concentration, insights. Morality, concentration. You keep doing this insights, eventually you will get nirvana. And since this has to be done by individual people themselves, that is why Buddhism is also called Shramana tradition. Neither God can help you in this, neither Deva can help you in this. You believe in God, you still have to do it yourself. You don't believe in God, you still have to do it yourself. That is why Buddha emphasizes, Buddhism itself emphasizes on the law of karma. Buddha outright rejected the authority of Veda. I mean, rejecting the authority of Veda basically means Buddha doesn't believe that Vedas are ultimate truth. So, he says Vedas needs to be understood from the perspective. At the same time, historians have called Buddha as an agnostic or agnostic. The reason being, Buddha neither rejects the concept of God, neither accepts the concept of God. In fact, Buddha does not discuss the concept of God. So, he leaves it totally to his followers. If they want to follow a God, their choice. If they do not want to follow a God, still their choice. Contrary to many other religions, in Buddhism, there is no theory of God, neither accepts it nor rejects it. Always in prelims, they will keep asking this. And for Buddha, all things in the world are transient and corollary means everything is connected. So, for example, if something is happening to you, it was previously connected to something in the past and it is going to be connected to something in the future. And every state in Buddhism is essentially temporary. It means happiness is a temporary state. It is eventually going to transform into something else. So, Buddhism believes that nothing is permanent. Everything is liable to change, stage after stage. While Buddha was alive only, Buddha created a Sangha. If you remember, I told this. Sangha had two types of people, the bhikshukus or shramanas, these are the monks and then the upasakas, upasakas are lay worshippers and lay followers, the bhikshukus are the monks, bhikshukus are the ones who are organized into a sangha or a group, okay, the bhikshus, the membership of sangha was open to all persons, male and female above the age of 15. And those who are free from leprosy, consumption because means alcoholic people and other infectious diseases. Except those who suffer from leprosy, consumption or from other infectious diseases. Generally, they were permitted to be members of a Buddhist Sangha. Also, 
persons who were in the service of the king previously or those who were completely in debt or those who are categorized as robbers they were also refused admission into sangha means those in for king servants those who were debt laden and those who are also called robbers these people were generally avoided from being part of sangha and as such remember sangha had no caste restrictions no gender restrictions no class restrictions and many sanghas even had none women monks eventually slowly slowly many of these buddhist sanghas during 7th by the time of 7th 8th century many of these buddhist sanghas had become into academic centers or universities every buddhist monk has to be a shramana shramana means self working so a monk has to earn his own bread a monk has to work for himself a new person who wants to join the sangha has to shave his head put a yellow robe yellow robe is in pali it's also called pundru remember buddhism's main language is pali old prakrit and every member every person who wants to be a member of sangha has to shave his head wear a yellow robe called pundru and take an oath of fidelity to the three ratnas the three principles of buddhism and sangha was generally governed on democratic lines means majority rule and was empowered to force discipline by one president elected member sangha parinayaka every sangha had a chairman called the sangha parinayaka and these sangha meetings used to form resolutions known as gnapati by writing their voting details on wooden sticks called salakas they used to write in wooden sticks and shake them so whichever stick follows majority of the stick which follows that approves the voting it used to be like this no assembly was valid unless 10 members or 10 monks were present this is basically the concept of quorum women no voices no voices means new members of the sangha were not entitled to vote or they wouldn't come under quorum so only male monks and senior members were permitted to vote but for becoming a member of sangha there was no restrictions okay after buddha's death there were four meetings have happened known as buddhist councils the first buddhist council happened at rajagriha satpani cave under the patronship of ajata shatru chairman was maha kashyapa this is where buddhist doctrines the books vinaya pitaka started to get right written the second council happened in vaishali state under the patronship of kala ashoka of shishnaga dynasty sabakami first split in buddhism theravada in mahasangika buddhism in 250 bc in patliputra greatest sangha greatest council ashoka's council happened under moggali puratissa where buddhism started to spread abroad i told in the beginning that ashoka started to spread buddhism abroad and in 72 ad the latest sangha under kanishka at kundalavana in kashmir under the chairmanship of guru vasumitra and later ashwaghosha this is where buddhism split into hinayana mahayana now this two words you hear a lot when you read about buddhism always remember in buddhism there are two sects today in buddhism there are two groups sect basically means like in hinduism we have vaishnavism shaivism shaktism samarthism just like that hinayana mahayana in buddhism a yana means a vehicle 
ഹീനയാന ലെസ്സർ വെഹിക്കിൾ മഹായാന ഗ്രേറ്റർ വെഹിക്കിൾ നോ ജസ്റ്റ് ഇമാജിൻ ദിസ് ലൈക്ക് ദിസ് ഹീനയാന ഇസ് എ ലെസ്സർ വെഹിക്കിൾ ഇറ്റ്സ് ലൈക്ക് എ കാർ ഇഫ് ദ ഡെസ്റ്റിനേഷൻ ഈസ് നിർവാണ സപ്പോസ് നിർവാണ ഈസ് ദ ഡെസ്റ്റിനേഷൻ ആൻഡ് യു ആർ ട്രാവലിംഗ് ഹീനയാന ഇസ് എ കാർ വെയർ ഓൺലി ഫ്യൂ പീപ്പിൾ ക്യാൻ ഫിറ്റ് സോ ഓൺലി ഫ്യൂ പീപ്പിൾ ക്യാൻ റീച്ച് ദ ഡെസ്റ്റിനേഷൻ ദാറ്റ് ഇസ് വാട്ട് ഹീനയാന ബിലീവ്സ് ബട്ട് മഹായാന ഇസ് ലൈക്ക് എ ബസ് a large vehicle where more people can accommodate and more people can attain salvation so mahayana believes greater number of people can always attain salvation in fact everybody can attain salvation but hinayana says only few who are worthy can attain salvation okay so here when we say vehicle we are basically talking about buddha's teachings buddha's teachings are generally seen as in hinayana only few people can actually understand the inner meaning of it and only few people are worthy of it so hinayana sometimes is also called deficient vehicle or defective vehicle it believes only in the original teachings of buddha they do not believe in idol worship they only believe in representation of buddha remember that bull lotus Uh, galloping horse uh, stupa those images exactly theravada is a hinayana group doctrine of elders it is believed that ashoka patronized theravada buddhism a sort of hinayana buddhism and pali the language of the masses during that period was mainly used by hinayana scholars and hinayana followers Mahayana on the other side believes in idol worship of Buddha generally called deification. Deification means praying Buddha as if Buddha is God. Here anybody can become Buddha by following the path of Buddha. Such a person who is actually following the path of Buddha as described by Buddha and he is on the way to attain salvation or nirvana he is called a bodhisattva a person who is on the path to become the next buddha by following the path prescribed by buddha he is called a bodhisattva and in mahayana everybody can attain salvation so mahayana is very accommodative china japan vietnam korea singapore taiwan the entire asia southeast many of the nations follow mahayana buddhism zen buddhism pure land buddhism tian tai buddhism nichiren shingon tibetan uh, shinto all of these are mahayana schools of buddhism they believe in buddha and after buddha bodhisattvas that people who are going to be the next buddha in terms of literature buddhist literature is categorized into two types canonical and non canonical this is a word which you will listen a lot canonical basically means those books which must be read and must be understood as they are you are not supposed to reinterpret them canonical books are something like vedas in hinduism main canonical literature of buddhism is vinaya pitaka sutta pitaka abhidhamma pitaka the tri pitakas these are written you are supposed to follow remember all buddhist literature canonical non canonical majority of them is written in pali buddhism was actually spread in the language of pali vinaya pitaka is actually a book which gives rules for monks sutta pitaka talks about teachings Sutta Pitaka talks about the teachings of Buddha. Vinaya Pitaka talks about the rules for the monks. Abhidhamma Pitaka gives us the details of Buddha's philosophy. The philosophy and the doctrine of Buddha is mentioned in 
అభిధమ్మ పీటక ద త్రిపీటకాస్ మస్ట్ బి రెడ్ యాజ్ ఇట్ ఈస్ ఆల్ స్కూల్స్ ఆఫ్ బుద్ధిజం హవ్ ఎవర్ డెఫినెట్లీ బిలీవ్ దట్ ద త్రిపీటకాస్ డు నాట్ డైరెక్ట్లీ రిప్రజెంట్ బుద్ధాస్ వర్డ్స్ బై హిమ్సెల్ఫ్ బికాస్ త్రిపీటకాస్ వర్ రిటర్న్ వర్ కంపైల్డ్ ఓన్లీ ఆఫ్టర్ ద డెత్ ఆఫ్ బుద్ధ ఇన్ ద ఫోర్ కౌన్సిల్స్ ఫ్రమ్ ఫోర్ ఎయిటీ త్రీ బీసీ టూ సెవెంటీ టూ ఎడి త్రిపీటకాస్ వర్ బేసికలీ కంపైల్డ్ ఓన్లీ ఆఫ్టర్ ద డెత్ ఆఫ్ బుద్ధ దే వర్ నాట్ పార్ట్ ఆఫ్ బుద్ధాస్ డిస్కోర్సెస్ దెమ్ సెల్స్ ఓకే యాజ్ దట్ వినయ పీటక న్యూమరస్ రూల్స్ ఫర్ ద కాండక్ట్ ఆఫ్ ఆర్డర్ సంఘాస్ సుత్త పీటక స్మాల్ అండ్ లాంగ్ డిస్కషన్స్ గివెన్ బై బుద్ధ హిమ్సెల్ఫ్ అభిధమ్మ పీటక విచ్ టాక్స్ అబౌట్ బుద్ధాస్ ఫిలాసఫీ అండ్ మెటాఫిజిక్స్ దేర్ ఆర్ న్యూమరస్ నాన్ క్యానానికల్ బుక్స్ నాన్ క్యానానికల్ బుక్స్ ఆర్ దోస్ విచ్ ఆర్ నాన్ రిలీజియస్ ఈవెన్ ఇఫ్ దే ఆర్ రిలీజియస్ దే ఆర్ సబ్జెక్ట్ టు ఇంటర్ప్రిటేషన్ in hinduism an equivalent of non canonical book is ramayana mahabharata milindapano where greek king menander embraced buddhism under the monk nagasena mahavatsu which talks about mahasangika uh, sect of buddhism lalita vesara an anonymous biography of buddha written in the gatha or old prakrit language and deepavamsam which actually dates to approximately 4th century AD. Lalita Vitsara, an anonymous biography of Buddha, written in old, Sans- old Sanskritized Prakrit. Okay, called the Gatha style of Prakrit. And Deepa Vamsam, one of the oldest historical records. of sri lanka oldest historical records of sri lanka okay now what was the, how did buddhism expand and develop ashoka is one king who can be given the maximum credit for not only spreading buddhism but also taking great efforts to spreading buddhism outside its land of origin for example spreading the buddha dharma in fact ashoka sent missionaries not only to south india but also to sri lanka burma and other countries la ashoka sent his two children mahendra and sanghamitra to sri lanka to spread buddhism greeks and kushanas also embraced buddhism for example greek king kanishka took great efforts to develop mahayana buddhism and ashoka hinayana buddhism so there were great efforts which were done in spreading buddhism harshavardhana in 7th century ce took great efforts again to spread buddhism in fact huen sang even explain how harsha patronized buddhism and even embraced buddhism in fact in approximately 643 ad harsha vardhana converted to buddhism after the battle of ganjam so between 200 bc to 700 ad series of kings series of monks series of sanghas kings monks individual monks like nagarjuna upagupta upasena taranada uh, tibetan monk and sanghas all the three did great efforts time and again to spread buddhism buddhist philosophy buddhist religion and buddhist beliefs a quick overview of what are the factors which led to the rise of buddhism see influence of time buddhism actually came at a time when people were extremely frustrated with vedic ritualism vedic rules vedic structures vedic timing they were people were just 
frustrated with it. So Buddhism seemed to be the best solution without deviating too much and not need to following too much of new religion. And Buddhism had very simple doctrines. There was no metaphysics, no talking about gods and atmas and paramatmas. Buddhism was quite understandable. It was firstly explained in Pali, which was actually the language of the common people because Sanskrit was the language of the elite. Pali was what majority spoke. It was easy to understand. And as a language also, Buddhism kept it quite simple. It never got into metaphysical stuff, more complicated stuff. And Buddha himself as a personality is a great contributor to Buddhism because I told you he was a practicalist. He only tried to solve those problems which were understandable to the common people and solvable in the first place. So Buddha's logic of not getting into discussions about God and Atma and Paramatma is these were intangible entities. These were things which can't be actually physically be solved or physically be explained. So Buddhism never got into it and Buddha never got into it. Buddhism was very inexpensive. No rituals. No temples. No restrictions. And Buddhism as such had no casteism, no classism. Strictly egalitarian. Time and again, Buddha received extensive patronage. Ashoka, Kushanas, Indo Greeks, Menander, etc., Rudraman, um, post Ashoka kings, Guptas, even Samudra Gupta, Kumara Gupta, who ended up constructing, uh, who ended up uh, creating Nalanda University, greatest Buddhist university. All the way till 700 AD, including Harsha, everybody supported Buddhism. And then universities like Nalanda, Vikramsila, Somarupa, Odantapuri, all these universities played great centers of learning. Not just for Indian monks, but also monks across the world. These universities were supported by some of the greatest Buddhist monks and Buddhist Sanghas. And the four councils which happened, they also helped in the rise of Buddhism. They took the responsibility of compiling Buddhist philosophy into physical books, the Tripitakas. And absence of strong rivals. In fact, the only other religious opportunity option to the people who were trying to get away from Vedic rigidity was Jainism. Jainism compared to Buddhism was very complicated and equally as rigid as Hinduism of that period, the later Vedic Hinduism. So, Buddhism never really had any rival. At the same time, one has to understand that Buddhism eventually declined in India. Primary reasons were, see many of the Buddhist Sanghas by 8th and 9th century had become corrupt, had become institutions of classism, the same classism which Buddhism actually rejected. And Bhakti reform in Hinduism actually solved a lot of problems of later Vedic rigidity and Bhakti reform helped in growing Hinduism. So there was no necessity for people to go into Buddhism because Hinduism also began to embrace the same concept of equality of people. Division among Buddhists was one of the reasons for cause of Buddhism's decline. Mahayana, Hinayana, Theravada, Mahasangika, there were Madhyamika, there were like numerous divisions, subdivisions, sub subdivision. There are split, 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 split. Continuously, this kept on happening. And the very core of Buddhism was Pali, which was people's language. But by the by third, fourth century AD, Buddhism was following 
Sanskrit. Now, Sanskrit is an elitist language. Guptas, Rashtrakutas, Cholas, they all encouraged Brahmanism. After Gupta period, we do not see that many supporters. And to some extent, one school of Brahmanism even made Buddha an avatar of Vishnu. So, because Buddhism itself started to become a subset of Hinduism or Puranic Hinduism, there was no purpose of growing Buddhism anymore. Many of the Hindu preachers like Shankaracharya, Madhavacharya did this. This logic of Buddha worship, creating idols of Buddha and doing puja for idols, it made no sense. And finally, Huna invasions, emergence of Rajputs and Islamic invasions. These Rajputs and Huna invasions declined the political support and Islamic invasion came with Sufism. Sufism was even more simpler religion than Buddhism. That is the story of Buddhism. We have seen the growth of Buddhism, the creation of Buddhism, the philosophy, the doctrines, the sects, the councils, how Buddhism spread across the world, what are the reasons for the growth of Buddhism, also the causes for the decline of Buddhism. That is it in this session for Buddhism guys, the first part of heterodox religion. We will continue in the next session about Jainism. Thank you. Bye-bye.